Welcome back to day six of the 100 horror films in 31 days. I got in six films today. I pounded out some watches today and some good ones too. First up, this Mondo Macabre release for Sat Satanica Pandemonium. Uh, this is a Mexican release directed by Gilberto Martinez Solaris, who also did Face of the Screaming Werewolf, which was uh, 1965. That's like the last Lon Chaney movie where, uh, I, certainly it's the last one where he did the, he was play the werewolf. But yeah, this is a non-sploitation film. Uh, you've got a woman that's, uh, well, she's obviously, she's a nun, but she's got a lot of sexual desires, um, and at, ultimately she gets enticed by Satan himself, Lucifer himself, to uh, commit sexually deviant acts and then murder. And uh, it's it's an it's a really good film, uh, one of my favorite of the non exploitations. I can definitely say that without a doubt. Uh, it's a great story, great, well acted and uh, a nice ending to the film. So I highly recommend this release if you don't have it. This has uh, an audio commentary with Cat Ellinger and then some interviews, which I haven't checked out yet, but definitely recommend this. I give it a 7 out of 10. I followed that up with an even better watch, which is uh, 1972's Images. Robert Altman directed this. Susanna York, British actress, uh, wrote this story apparently about a about a what appears to be. It, it's very hard to take anything within images at face value, but the storyline is Susanna York uh, is seeing in her husband and others uh, alternate people. Like, uh, I mean, it's it's it gets kind of like she's. Uh, doppelganger type stuff where she, it, it, she's either she's either crazy I would say based on what watching it that she's just simply schizophrenic nuts but uh, she <clears throat> she sees her ex-husband who, who was supposed to have died in an airplane crash uh, one minute it's her husband one minute it's the ex-husband uh, the next thing is she's got an ex-lover that shows up and one minute she thinks she's talking to her husband and it's and it's the ex-lover and then vice versa uh, and this goes on in a very tense very tense very interesting fashion robert altman is fantastic with the way he uh sets up each scene it's just a, it's just a i'm not gonna say it's it's short of a masterpiece but it's a great great movie uh psychological slow burn that really gets under your skin some genuinely, genuine, genuinely creepy moments in this. This is an Arrow Academy release, <clears throat> and it's got a um, audio commentary and interviews and other special features, which I haven't checked out yet. But boy, one of the best watches of um, this October is Images. <clears throat> Next up is. Next up is Offerings. 1989 88 films release uh, this is the I have, I don't didn't know much about this in fact this is my first watch of this film and this is just straight up uh, unabashedly a uh, copycat of ha Halloween I mean it, it's the it's the story of Halloween almost to a T and and the kicker the clincher is the music I don't know how these guys got away with Ralph Portillo as the director. I don't know how they got away with um, the music is almost note for note in some instances the Halloween music. I don't I don't know how they pulled that off and haven't had repercussions legally, but they did. I guess the film's not good. <clears throat> I mean, obviously it's uh, it's it's poorly acted and it's it's. It's 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 interesting just because you know you're sitting there watching another Halloween, and again I think I talked about this yesterday. If you're going to copy a classic movie like that, shot for shot or the basic storyline, characters, etc., you better make sure you have some kind of a payoff, i.e., good kills, 
you know, a, a really clincher ending. And, and, <clears throat> and unfortunately for a lot of these films, they got the copycat part right, but they just don't get the other part right. I mean, it, it, when you're making a slasher movie, you, it should center around iconic kills. But a lot of them just don't, they just fall flat when it comes to that. Anyway, what you got here is a boy that uh, was was um, harassed by some friends it's early on, and and then he falls in a well, pushed in a well by one of the kids, and then it fast forwards to this him breaking out of a psychiatric facility and, and terrorizing and attacking and, and getting revenge on these kids that did him wrong, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, yeah, that's that's it, and you know, even the character, even the character of the killer, he's he's got kind of a zombie-like Michael. Type. He's not wearing a mask. He's different in that aspect. He just he's got kind of a deformed face, and he's just kind of walks around, kind of like a uh, an automaton, a possessed monster, you know, hard to kill and that type of thing. So in that respect, it's just like Michael, except for the mask. That's the only difference. Uh, but yeah, it's just it's just a low budget copycat. Uh, the director Ralph Portillo, I, I'm really interested in checking out the special features on this because when you look at his when you look at his uh, work, actually I, I take that back. I'm getting Ralph conf confused with someone else. Uh, this is Christopher Reynolds that directed this. Um, I, I, I I'm not. I just don't know. I don't know what they were... Th Obviously, they were thinking, how can we make some money and copy something that was successful? I get that part of it, but uh, there's a deeper cut of it that I would like to get some information on. Yeah, that, this is just a... It's not a, it's not horrible, okay? I give it a 5 out of 10. Uh, but it just fails. It just fails to deliver the goods when it needed to. It had the basic premise... It copied it from Halloween, you know, but but that's not enough. I mean, uh, you you can copy, you know, you can try to try to emulate talent, but at some point, emulation becomes tedium and boredom until you can show something different and interesting and unique, and it just isn't there. So, yeah, that's it with uh, offerings. <clears throat> I'm getting Ralph I'm going to let's go ahead and talk about Fear No Evil because Fear No Evil 1981 that is my buddy Frank Lagagia Lagagia who um, apparently he and his brother did this film they didn't do too much after this uh, it, this is a weird film this is batshit crazy it's basically a Satan film worshipping film um Lucifer manifests himself um, in, in different, possesses different people. And then in this case, he's possessing this boy here. Um, and, and you get that right off the bat because when he gets christened in a church and there's blood pouring from the roof of the church. So, uh, so it, it's basically a setup for him. Um, there's also a situation where the, a, a priest had killed what he thought was to be Lucifer incarnate on the earth before and, um, you know, got in trouble, obviously got in big time trouble for that. And his wife is now picking up the mantle and chasing down the new incarnate. It's a, the last 20 minutes are batshit crazy. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's an interesting, unique, it's a unique film, early 1980s film. I never saw it before. This is a first time watch. And uh, <laughs> all I can say is the last 20 minutes are, are definitely a payoff. It's definitely worth your time and attention just for that last 20 minutes. There is a, there's a, this is a uh, 4K scan. And you've got some interviews. I believe there's an, there is an audio commentary on here, which I definitely... This is one I'm looking forward to checking out the audio commentary as well on. I give it a 6.5 out of 10. 
Next up is, I watched this on Netflix, Berlin Syndrome 2017. Uh, it's about an Australian girl that's going uh, by herself. You know, that's always going to be a problem, right? By herself, touring Berlin. She's kind of a, she appreciates the architecture of Berlin and she wants to, uh, you know, tour Berlin. She runs into the street, uh, right on the street with this stranger. They strike up a conversation and that leads to her sleeping with the guy in his apartment and for one thing led to another and he basically he he traps her in the house and uh keeps her locked up in the house he's got he's got and the house was already ready he's done this before the house the windows are specially sealed you know he's got straight he's got special padlocks on the door so he keeps this woman hostage in his house uh, and, and the whole film, which is a running time of about a, almost two hours, is her plotting to try and get out of the house. It's a very tense film. Simple story, but very tense, well acted. I, I, I thought it was really, really good. Probably could have been cut down. I mean, it was a little self-indulgent at two hours. I think it's more like a 90-minute film, maybe... 90 100 minutes but it's, two hours was a bit much uh, but yeah it's a good it's a good film i definitely recommend you checking it out it was directed by a female named kate kate shortland shortland kate shortland uh she did black widow too looks like uh she's an australian writer and director uh the the lead in this Teresa palmer i thought was very good she did a good job uh, she's been in a lot of stuff. But yeah, Berlin Syndrome. D definitely, if you got Netflix, uh, I would recommend checking that out. i give it a 7 out of 10. And then finally, last but not least, 1997's Vicious Sweet. This is a shot on Shidio, which is on this American Gore uh, DVD set here. <clears throat> It's a Ron Bonk film. I don't know if that's his real last name, but I think he's a director from Salt Lake City because the credits were showing it was um, f production was in Salt Lake City. Uh, basically, you've got an actress, a horror actress that's uh, narcissistic to the extreme. Uh, and she kind of blows off her boyfriend when he asks her to marry her. And then... Uh, she gets captured by quote a fan who tries to uh, basically rebirth her into a, into a decent person. Uh, it, it's a 90 minute long film of just endless dialogue between the two. That's one of the problems I think with independent. I, I, I'm not a fan too much of these independent films, low budget independent films because they all, they, for some reason, they all insist upon having these long, lengthy, dialogue-driven, boring scenes. Uh, and, and you're waiting for a payoff, and there is no payoff. I mean, it, it, it's usually a shitty special effect or some... But, uh, yeah, I mean, they just... Independent filmmakers, for some reason, don't know how to, don't know how to edit their film and cut out all this verbiage that nobody gives a shit about. I mean, after a while, you just don't care about her backstory. And this, this guy that captured her spends endless time in the film questioning her childhood and all that shit. It's just, it just needs, it just, it should have moved. They need, it needed to move on. You know, it was too self-indulgent. Uh, it's, it's bad, basically. It's, uh, it, it's technically bad, too. It's, um, this, their sound quality is sounds like they've the recording was done through a toilet bowl. Uh, there the lighting is shit, and uh, it's just bad. So I give it a, I give it a one out of ten. That's it. That's it for day six. Appreciate you watching.